Okay. So what I'm going to talk about today is the dark side of dentistry. And this is something I think that many people don't talk about, unfortunately. And I will introduce myself first so that you guys know where I'm coming from and, and maybe why I'm talking about this. Aha. Okay. So I went to the University of Southern California where I studied under a guy named Pascal Magne. Many of you guys may know Pascal, you know, really uh, an international world leader in aesthetic dentistry, biomimetic dentistry. It was at that time that I told Pascal I wanted to learn implants. And so he told me I needed to learn Brazilian Portuguese and move to Brazil. So that's what I did. I went to a place called Florianopolis, Brazil, where I did my implant residency, implant specialty, really a, a beautiful place in South Brazil. At the time, he, he told me that Brazil was really a leader in implant dentistry. You know, Dr. Branemark from Sweden was even teaching in Brazil six months out of the year so that I needed to go there. It was something that a lot of people told me I was crazy for but I did it and it was really, really rewarding. I got to do a lot of things that you can't really do in a private practice setting because we were in a, a university setting. So really crazy things. And I got to learn a lot in a relatively short amount of time. So I came back to University of Southern California where I was teaching with Pascal for many years. Also teaching with my, my now business partner, Matt Najad, who you may know, really an, an excellent restorative doctor. And it was at this time that Pascal asked me to help him teach his dental morphology function and aesthetics course. So every Wednesday for the past nine years, I've been with Pascal. And it was just this last year that I, I stopped teaching because I didn't, I didn't have time. I was teaching all over the place. So Pascal introduced me to my next mentor, Sasha Jovanovic, um, like Matthew said, at, uh, at the Guide Center here in LA. And Sasha and I teach a bunch of courses together. He's a world-renowned speaker in um, implant dentistry, guided bone regeneration, just a super cool guy. So I had these two mentors, Dr. Jovanovic, Dr. Manier, and then I even got a third mentor, a guy named Christian Coachman, that I'm sure everybody knows about, the inventor of DSD. Just uh, an amazing guy that has progressed dentistry so much in the last few years. So I'm lucky that my mentors even hang out. Um, I'm a researcher, so I do a lot of research. I try to publish a few times a year. You know, everything from big bloody surgeries to really small little aesthetic things to AI and, and all different kinds of, of topics. Like many of you guys, I have a private practice. So I have two great partners, like I said, Matt Najad and Mark Helm. And we're in Beverly Hills and we do low volume, high end dentistry, which I think is what, what a lot of people would, would like to practice like. The, the, the problem that comes with this is that there's a lot of pressure to do high end dentistry, to do complicated cases. And we'll get into this and we'll talk about this a little later, but this is our practice. So kind of a clean, very small, you know, we see a small amount of patients during the day. We don't see like a ton all at once. And our fees are, are pretty high compared to our neighbors in the building. So it's a different style of business, but it's, um, it's the way that we like to practice. You know, we, we use rubber dam on all of our cases. We do everything with guided surgery. We try to do the highest level that we can. And that's how we practice. So I have a skateboarding and surfing English bulldog named Butterball, and she keeps us, keeps us laughing. And then my, my beautiful wife, Brianna, and my son here, Valco. So that's my, my personal life, and that's, that's kind of where I came from. And so I think to start this lecture off, I have to congratulate everybody. I know we have a lot of people from Australia, I you know we have people from all over the world, but um, in America, us dentists, we actually have the best job in America. 
which is which is kind of cool. So the U.S. News and World Report did the the hundred best jobs in America, and dentists was always number one for multiple multiple years. And this was one from 2018. And when you look here, you have uh, the dentist is number two, but in the top 17, you can see we have dentist, orthodontist, maxillofacial surgeon, prosthodontist, dental hygienist. So the dental world takes over when you think about like who are the top jobs in America. And when, when this was posted originally, when we were number one, I think it was 2017, I reposted this, the dean of my university posted this. I reposted it as kind of a, a flex saying, hey, you know, look at how cool we are. We have the best job in America. And when you look specifically on this, it talks about how, you know, us dentists make pretty good money. There's not a lot of us that don't have jobs, except for right now. Um, a lot of job increase because we have older dentists that are retiring you know, a lot more spots for newer dentists to come along. But when I, when I looked deeper, what I saw was that it said that the stress level was low or average. And I didn't feel that way. You look here, this is another one from uh, CNN. Low stress level. And I don't know about many of you guys, but running a practice, having patients, having complications. I didn't have low stress. I had very high stress actually. So I'd like to tell you a little story about um, a doctor in Brazil. So this is Dr. Jose Claudio Gimelo Filho. My friend Eduardo is on the left here. Uh, he's in the tan shirt and that's his dad to the right. So he was telling me a story about his dad. His dad was one of the top implant surgeons in Brazil. He actually was a university professor at where I got my training in Brazil. He helped to start the program even. He placed over 5,000 implants. He was a millionaire. He made plenty of money. He did the complex cases that you know none of the other doctors wanted to do. He was saving all the other doctors. He had celebrity clients that flew in to, uh, you know, from Miami, from around the world on their private jets so that he could do their implants. He was really, I think, living the dream of what a lot of us would like, would like to think of. You know, he had three sons, he was married. And I'll show you some of his cases. So take into account, this case I'm gonna show you is from the late 90s. And when you look at the concepts that are used, this is so forward thinking. Using peritomes to extract teeth, okay, minimally invasive extraction, doing immediate placement at the time of extraction in the late 90s was almost unheard of. Using the natural tooth for the provisional, something that is still considered modern. Placing the implant immediately, like I said, and making a custom zirconia abutment. Back then, this was unheard of. Unheard of. No one was doing zirconia, let alone custom zirconia. And when you can, when you look here, we have just an amazing, amazing result. So you can see the the quality of his treatment and really how he was one of the top implant surgeons in Brazil. And when I talked to my friend, Eduardo, he told me more about his dad. He told me that his dad was a workaholic. His dad worked, you know, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. at least five days a week. He had no friends. He had no hobbies. His friend was dentistry. His hobbies or hobby was dentistry, like many of us. He couldn't relax. He told me a story about how they went on, uh, they had a beach house on uh, another side of, of the island in Brazil. And they went there for a month. And after 15 days, his dad said, I'm opening up the practice again. There's nothing to do. He just needed dentistry. He stopped teaching at the university and started a, cl a clinic where he was you know, treating celebrities and all of the high, high profile patients. 
And then he started to have complications like, like we all do. And if you've done enough, you've had complications. And he also had a family history of depression. And on Father's Day, 2013, he hung himself in his apartment complex. One of the top implant surgeons in Brazil. He had more money than you can think of. He had more respect than you could ever want in our profession. And when I talked to my friend Eduardo about this, and he's very cool to share this story with us, we look back on it and he tells me why this happened. And we're gonna go through some of the some of the the reasons why there is this stigma in our society about talking about depression, why doctors are committing suicide, why many of us are depressed, and this dark side of dentistry, because I think that unless we talk about it, we're never gonna be comfortable admitting that we may be depressed or we may be sad. So with suicide, dentists are 1.6 times more likely to commit suicide, said a 2014 study. Another one that's very scary, being a dentist increased risk of suicide by 564%. Crazy, crazy, crazy numbers and very scary. And I would like to ask everybody, if you see the little chat box at the bottom, if you know a dentist who's committed suicide, just write yes in the chat box so that we can see um, how many of you have been impacted by this. If you know somebody, okay, so I see this going up 10, 11, 13, 15, 17, if you know somebody or know of a dentist, not if you know them personally, but maybe a friend of a friend or a classmate or something. And this is crazy right now we're at 30. So a lot of people 34. When I ask this question at big meetings, oftentimes 70% of the hands go up. 70% of the hands go up. We just had 40 people that know a dentist. Now, if, if we were all construction workers, or if we were all teachers, or if we were cleaning people, do you think that there would be that many yeses? And I would say probably not. Right now we're at 40%. So we're at like a fifth of us, one out of five of us know a dentist who has committed suicide. Here's the business insider. This just came out actually recently. Jobs that put your overall health at risk. Look at number one, two, four, five, and seven. Dental hygienist, general dentist, dental laboratory technician, dental assistants, dental prosthodontist. This is crazy. This is crazy that so many dental jobs are in the top seven of jobs that put your health at risk. So why are we killing ourselves? Why are so many of our colleagues feeling that they don't have a way out, that they're too stressed out, and that they, they can only go one way? So I'm gonna go through my 12 reasons that dentists are, are stressed out. And how I got here is that I went through a very difficult time. About three years ago, I was speaking at top symposiums in the world. I had celebrity patients. I was successful. I made plenty of money. Um, you know, I had a great family, still do. And I almost quit dentistry in general. I was so stressed out. And my, I recently had a son that was born that I felt like I couldn't focus on being a father or being a husband because I was so stressed out about my job. And I sat down and said, I need to figure out why this is. 
And what I'm showing you today is the fruits of, of me going through this hard time. So number one, environment of fear. I started looking at what are the biggest fears in the world? And number one is public speaking. So, hey, I, I beat that one. Number two is the dentist. And number three is death. Many of our patients would rather die than come to see us. And you've all been there. You've seen patients who are literally shaking in your chair, crying. They won't come in. They are so, so, so afraid of you. And this comes off on us. You know that when you're working on a patient that is jumpy, they feel like they're going to move every time you do something, we're afraid. And they did a study where they tested doctors' blood pressure as we gave injections, not received, but gave injections. And our blood pressure can sometimes go up by 20 points. So us having empathy actually can stress us out with our patients who have this fear. Number two is the media portrayal. I don't know about in Australia, but in the United States, we don't have a great reputation with the media and with the average consumer. You know, this is normally how we're thought of. I don't know if you guys know, but there was this, this dentist uh, who killed a lion a few years ago and so, from the U.S. And so much of it, they focused on well, he's a dentist. Of course he killed this lion. Dentists are crazy and they're masochists and they're sadists and they just want to hurt people and they're kooky and they're these bumbling idiots. And never in the media do we get a positive light showing like, wow, they can make you healthy and make you look better. They can give you back your confidence. They can allow you to start dating again. They can you know, allow you to smile, to be with your children, to not be afraid to interact with other people. Very rarely do they ever talk about that. They like to focus on the fact that, you know, we love hurting people and um, we get pleasure out of this even. And so this media portrayal, it always perceives our practices as just horror, absolute horror. And patients are afraid they don't want to come see us. And I'm sure that you guys have been in this position before. And this happens to me when I'm on planes or when I'm at parties. They say, hey, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a dentist. And they go, I hate dentists. And what I usually say next is, remember when I just told you that I was a dentist? And people think that it's so... Like, it's okay to say this to people. And when I first got out of school, I started getting used to people saying this. And then like after, you know, two, three years of teaching and working and practicing, I'm like, people just say this to you all the time? And if I, like I said, if I was a construction worker, if I was a teacher, or if I was a furniture designer or anything, you wouldn't say, oh, I hate furniture designers. I hate construction workers. I hate teachers. But people have this fear that they feel that it's okay to say this. Litigation. Litigation is a big problem in the United States. And I know that it's a problem in the UK. I'm not sure if it's a problem in Australia, but we can talk about that uh, afterwards in the Q&A. But litigation is causing a lot of stress for doctors in the US. So 5% of all medical malpractice trials involve dentists. The median price tag is about $53,000, not including legal fees, which is a lot. You know, maybe double, triple that. So you're looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars to defend yourself, even if you lose. 72% of dentists are actively fearful of being sued. So actively fearful means that when you're treatment planning, you're thinking, I'm going to treatment plan so I don't get sued. When you're treating the patient, you're thinking, I'm going to treat in this certain way so that I don't get sued. And that's really not the way to do dentistry. We should be thinking, what's best for my patient? 
what's most predictable, what's the least invasive, not what am I not going to get sued for? But it's a reality that we have to think about. So when we're treatment planning based on this, this can change our treatment plans, which is not good. We have media coverage of clinical neglect. So anytime something bad happens at a dental office, it's always covered. You know, heaven forbid a child dies in a dental office, it happens. But we focus on why this happens and it's all over the news. If, you know, someone has a heart attack in a dental office, it's always covered. We have high patient expectations, especially in my area in Beverly Hills. We have high load to where oftentimes we're treating a lot of patients. So this kind of stuff happens. Nine out of 10 dentists should expect to be sued by a patient or employee during their career. This came from Dental Economics, a publication in the US. Very, very scary that sometime in your clinical practice, you'll be sued by a patient or an employee. Now, I'm lucky that that hasn't happened to me, but I've been threatened for sure. And I'll tell you that it ruined that whole year for sure. I would lay in bed thinking about that, not thinking about my wife laying next to me or my son in the other room or my family. I was thinking about, I don't want to get sued. 42% of dentists have received a claim for clinical negligence during their career. The claims affect stress, morale, confidence, and your health. I know many of you that have been there that are watching this know that you can physically get ill from stress, from emotion, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, being tired all the time, overeating from stress, being physically ill. Number four is debt. Debt is a huge problem in the United States. So the average dental student comes out of school with $287,000 in debt. I was almost double that, almost $500,000 in debt when I came out of school. You know, that's before you buy a house, you get married, you buy a practice, you do CE courses, et cetera, et cetera that oftentimes people are in debt one, $2 million by the time they're 30 years old. And then the price of dental school keeps going up in the United States. So it's gone up four times since 1990 when the compensation hasn't gone up four times. So you add all of this debt on top of each other and then you have so many of us young doctors that say, I just need to pay my bills. So many times we go into you know, group practices, which I think is a great way to start out. But what we know that can negatively happen with group practices is you can be forced to do treatments, forced to do unethical treatments that we then feel bad about that brings us even further down. There were some big companies, so Merck, the big pharmaceutical company, and Home Depot, which is a big like uh, DIY um, store in the United States, donated you know quarter of a billion dollars to help some medical schools in the United States so that medical doctors could come out of school with less debt. So that's exciting. Number five is revisions. Now you may be looking at this and saying, what the hell is a revision? Because this is something that we don't, we don't use this term in dentistry. Well, here's some of my complications. Okay, some of my, my own problems, right? Here's a fun one. Patient calls a few days later. Yeah, it's a little gray in the front. Oh, that's probably just, you know, a bruise or something. Well, and this is what I see a few days later. Now, revisions are something that is used in the medical community. So in the medical community, if I jump off you know, my house or fall off my house and um, I break my ankle in 30 pieces, I go and get surgery. When I'm done, 
if I limp, I don't blame my surgeon and sue my surgeon. Or if I need to get a revision surgery, I pay again. It doesn't happen for free. But in dentistry, for some reason, we are conditioned that it's everything is our fault. Every complication is our fault and we have to pay for it or we have to redo it for free. And when you, when I talk to my medical community friends, they don't get this. They're like, you just do the surgery for free again. What do you mean? You just redo the crown. What if the patient did something wrong? So we know that mistakes happen both you know, we can make mistakes, we're human, and the patient can make mistakes too. We know that biology happens. So I like to say that there's a triad. You have biology, the patient, and the doctor. And we don't necessarily know where the complication came from. I can do everything right sometimes, the patient can do everything right, follow all of my instructions, and we still have failures. We have medicine and dentistry being vastly different. And in the United States, insurances dictate many treatments. The dentists are expected to pay for the additional treatment, which really makes no sense when it may not be our fault. And we take the financial burden on that as well. We're oftentimes pursuing perfection. Our patients are pursuing perfection and a perfect restoration can become damaged by a patient's neglect, even though we do the best possible. So what I'll tell my patients sometimes is, okay, Mrs. Jones, you know, I did this restoration and I did it to my best of ability. Now, how this lasts now depends on you, how you treat it, how you clean it, how you use it. Um, so it, it, it shouldn't all be bearing on us reconstructing beauty this is a difficult thing to deal with um, in beverly hills we have a very beauty centered culture of course and with having hollywood here and you know, movies and industry the 1990s brought cosmetic dentistry and this was really a great thing i think for dentistry it allowed patients to realize that we can change your life with dentistry. We can give you a new smile. We can give you a new outlook on life, get your confidence back. But then patients started utilizing dentistry to reconstruct their own beauty, their inner beauty even. And doctors are now being held to very high standards. I know you guys have those patients that come in, they hold the mirror and they say things like embrasures and gingival margins and mammalons. And you're like, what the hell, how do you know all this stuff? They bring crazy high standards to us and it's really difficult. My cosmetic patients are super picky. And in dentistry, we are such picky people by nature. You know, we measure in tenths of a millimeter. It is really a difficult job that we have. And I know specifically about reconstructing beauty because I write research about plastic surgery and dentistry coming together. So it's really at the, at the forefront of, of my practice. So it's important to know that patients must have their own personal identity. They must know that their self-worth cannot come from what you do. And they have to have a purpose in their life, something other than being beautiful. So this comes with interacting with your patients, talking with your patients. Isolation. Isolation is a big problem in dentistry, but I'm happy to say that it's getting better. Most dentists for the last 50 years have practiced in small, sometimes windowless offices by themselves. And this was how my dad did it for almost 40 years, or actually no, for more than 40 years, I think for 43 years. He practiced by himself with in windowless office. And he had no one to really interact with. 
I think now, because of the financial situation, many doctors are moving towards that group practice, which can be great. I practice with two other doctors and I absolutely love it. And I encourage people to have colleagues or partners. Of course, it can be difficult to have partners. There's multiple brains, multiple cooks in the kitchen, but um, you don't have this isolation issue that leaves you vulnerable to depression. Number eight, professional jealousy. This is something that has really increased in the last 10 years. You know, when my dad was practicing, he didn't know what the guy down the street did unless, you know, his or her patient came into his practice. But now, you know, oh my gosh, look at what Florin Kofar did, or look at what Eric Van Duren did, or look at how Pascal Mani does those veneers. And this happens every day on social media. And these are some of my friends. Um, well, three of them are my friends. Just amazing, amazing dentists. And you look at this stuff and you say, there's no way I could ever do a tissue graft like that. I could ever do inlays like that. I could ever do veneers like that. I could ever do rubber dam isolation like that. But we have to remember is that people's social media is not real life. This is their highlight reel. Oftentimes this is the good cases. The very real people, and I always mention Joseph Kahn, who's out here from LA, he always shows his failures. And I think that's where we need to go. And I know it's difficult because oftentimes we're trying to show our successes to get patients to do treatment and say, look at how good I am. But showing failures really allows you to be human. And oftentimes people will respect you more by showing your failures. Lung disease. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this, but this is a great title of an article from Yahoo in 2018. A fatal disease is striking dentists and no one knows exactly why. All right, great. Add it to the list of things that we have to, have to think about. So I started looking into this. It's called idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So what does idiopathic mean? We have no clue what causes it. It's chronic, progressive, ultimately deadly lung disease. There's no cure, usually die within a few years. And when you look at the statistics, it doesn't seem that crazy. 1% of IPF patients are dentists. Okay, that doesn't seem like a big deal, right? 1%. But in the United States, 0.038% of the population are dentists. So that's a 2,500% increase than what it should be. And when we think about this, you know, it's very timely with what's happening right now with COVID, but we have, we're, we're grinding stuff. Sometimes we're not wearing masks. Sometimes we are wearing masks. We're inhaling things. You know, we're inhaling PMMA and composite and blood and saliva and everything is an aerosol in, in dentistry. And what I learned, after, actually, when I was lecturing about this, someone told me afterwards is the great Pete Dawson, who, you know, the um, occlusion kind of master of the world actually died of this. So this isn't like something that it's nobody that you know. Number 10, dynamic region of the body. We treat such a difficult part of the body. So I have a friend who's a foot and ankle surgeon and I asked him one day, hey, how, did, how do you do surgery? And he said, well, you know, my patients are sedated under general anesthesia. They have a tourniquet around their leg, so there's no blood. It's a sterile procedure. I stand, I have my loops, and I don't have to hunch over and, you know, I just do my surgery. And when you relate that to how we do treatment, you know, we work through a Cheerio, we're hunched over, even if you're using loops, um, you have saliva, you have the tongue, you have blood, you know, we can't put a tourniquet around our patient's neck. Sometimes we'd like to do that on certain patients. There's, there's nothing we can do to increase this. It's just a very dynamic region. And like my friend, when he does, you know, let's say an ankle surgery, he tells the patient, you can't walk for six weeks or 10 weeks or whatever it is. 
it's difficult for us to say, well, sorry, you can't eat for 10 weeks or, you know, you can't smile for 10 weeks or you can't talk for 10 weeks or you can't swallow for 10 weeks. It's just not possible in our profession. Physical and emotional stress. This is something that I definitely suffered from and, and still suffer from with, with extreme back pain, actually. More than 90% of practicing dentists experience musculoskeletal pain. 90%. Shoulder, back, neck, hips, knees. We're in these weird positions all the time. And even if you're using microscopes, microscopes are a huge help to that. But our eyes can get strained so much from looking through a microscope for eight hours a day. Or our wrists can hurt from moving repeated motions over and over again. Our elbows, our shoulders. And when you look at how we work, we don't work in a sterile, bloodless, ergonomic way. We're hunched over and many of us have, have these really, really painful, painful things happening. I had a very extreme, extreme back pain that hurt 24 seven while I was sleeping, while I was working, while I was standing, while I was sitting, while I was swimming, everything, it always hurt. Now, emotional stress, which can be even more painful than physical stress. 11% of dentists have depression. Only 6.7% of the general population have depression. 6% of dentists have anxiety disorder. Only 3% of the general population has anxiety disorder. 4.2% of dentists have panic disorder. Only 2.7% of the general population have panic disorder. So when you look at these statistics, and this is from the Journal of the American Dental Association, we're two times more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety, and panic disorder. Now, why aren't we talking about this? Why am I the only person that's talking about this? This is such an important topic. It's more important than how to place an implant. It's more important than how to use rubber dam, how to get good dentin bonding. You can't do any of that shit if you don't have a good mind, if you're not stressed out, if you're not anxious. You can't treat your patients well. And talking about the uh, Dr. Jose that I told you about earlier from Brazil, his son told me that as he got more depressed, he did worse dentistry. And then he got more depressed about himself doing worse dentistry, which was like this downward, downward spiral. So a 2004 study showed 3,500 dentists surveyed, 38% are frequently or always worried. 34% are always physically or emotionally exhausted. This was definitely me. You have your patients, your staff, your partners, your insurance, you're kind of juggling all these different things, your family, you're trying to be a family man or a family woman and you're going home, but then you have to run a practice, but then you have to be a doctor, but then you have to pay your bills and we're struggling with all of these things. And I think the thing that makes us most human is that we all go through this. Time constraints are a big thing on us. We feel like we're always behind. We're always stressed on time. And we have this time versus quality, right? Oh, I can't use rubber dam because that takes more time. But I really want to do good quality. And oh, but I can't make enough money to do that. And everything kind of comes together. And the last one, which is a very important one that I didn't realize was so important until I personally went through this. And this is the lack of sympathy. So with emotional stress, there's this societal taboo about depression. If you go to someone and say, hey, I'm going through depression, they may think, well, you're weak. Just get over it, just be stronger. And this is what I used to think before I went through it. I used to think, just get over it. Just be happy. What do you mean? Just like, get better, jump out of it. Hey, snap out of it. 
And if you've been through this, you know that's not how it works. It's seen as complaining from dentists. So I don't know if any of you guys who have gone through this have talked to any of your colleagues, or not colleagues, but uh, friends who aren't dentists, or even your spouse, or your parents. But many times they'll say, what do you mean? You're a dentist, you're a doctor, you drive a nice car, you've got a great family, you're well respected in the community. What do you have to be worried about? And what I found was that I was a hypocrite like this as well, because I did this with celebrities. I thought they're successful, they're wealthy, they're famous. What do they have to be worried about? And the same thing happens with dentists. You have people that will not give you sympathy because we're well respected and because we may make um, a good amount of money. And what I learned that sympathy is very hard to come by. And that can be from, you know, the people you love the most. They may not get it unless they have gone through what we've gone through. I always say in the trenches, unless they've been in the trenches with us. So in that sense, we can be like celebrities to where we can be relatively successful, well-respected, well-known even. And if you talk to somebody, you get no sympathy about your problems. So what's the answer here? Well, I don't know if I have a lot of answers. My goal in talking about this is to get it exposed so that we all start talking about this, so that the over 200 people, 250, 300 people on here can talk about this to a colleague, to a spouse, to a family member, to anybody. Start talking about it. So what's the answer here? Well, well in an ideal world, a public awareness and acceptance of depression would be great. We may be pretty far from that. Positive media associations with dentistry internationally is something that I've been trying to work on with the American Dental Association. And hopefully you guys can work with your local dental societies or associations on this, showing how we can really change lives with what we do. Litigation reform, there's certain states in the United States where it's difficult to sue a dentist, um, but you know that's difficult with politics. Let's let technology do some of the work for us. So I'm big on technology, whether it's AI or guided surgery or face scans or whatever, but utilizing technology to take away some of the unpredictable aspects of our profession can help you with your stress. Anytime you can make dentistry more predictable, it's gonna be less stressful on you and you'll ultimately do better treatment. Don't overwork or over leverage yourself. I think this is something that I did that I, I really learned the hard way. You know, when I got out of school, I was working six days a week because I have to pay off these loans. And, and then I finally got it down to five days a week, but it was five days a week, you know, getting there at 7 a.m. and leaving at 7 p.m. And that's just, you can't do that forever. Work in a group setting, support each other, talk about this. I think supporting each other is huge, whether that is on social media, not um, talking bad about each other, supporting each other, supporting our profession. Together, we can find something better for our profession. And the last part is to find your purpose. And if there's anything that I would like for you to take away from today, it's this, it's this topic, find your purpose. So when I got out of dental school, I thought that my purpose was to be a dentist. And the problem with this is that we all make mistakes. We all have complications. We all have revisions. And if you think your purpose is your profession, when something goes wrong in your profession, you lose your self-worth. So what happened to me was I had cases where, you know, implants were failing or prosthetics were fracturing or patients weren't happy with the results. And I took that internally because if my purpose is to be a dentist and I'm not good at being a dentist anymore, then what do I have? 
And so what I learned was that my purpose is not to be a dentist. My purpose in life is to be a father. My purpose in life is to be a husband, is to be a brother, to be a family man, to take care of my family. That's my purpose in life. Dentistry is my profession. It can be a passion of yours. So what I encourage you to do is when you meet somebody, whether it's at a party or an airplane or whatever, and they say like, so tell me about yourself. Or what do you do? Start with your purpose. You know, I'm a father, I'm a husband. I also happen to do dentistry. My profession is dentistry. And there's a great, great quote that just came out a few weeks ago from Bill Gates. And he said, that this COVID-19 is reminding us that our true work is not our job. That's what we do. That's not what we were created to do. Our true work is to look after each other, to protect each other, and to be of benefit to one another. And I just love that that is something that we can really appreciate right now while we're all at home, while we're with our kids, with our dogs, with our families, with our wives, or even if you're by yourself, with yourself to appreciate this time because it's rare that we'll get this time again. And what I've always said on all of my you know, Instagram lives that I've been doing is the people that benefit the most right now from this are children and dogs. <laughs> you know, kids get their parents home 24 hours a day. And I'm sure that's every kid's dream to have their mom and dad, or whether there's only a single parent, or whether they have two parents or three parents, or who knows, to have their parents home uh, every day, I think is, is a pretty special thing. Now, specifically, one thing I like to say is don't stress about the things you can control. So what this plays into is like, you know, I talk about guided surgery, and you guys are free to ask questions about implant dentistry as well. I do everything I can to make this very unpredictable profession more predictable. So I'm not stressing about where the implant goes because I have guided surgery. I'm not stressing about, you know, if the smile is going to work match with the lower lip because I did it digitally. So I try to do everything I can to control so that there's very little aspects that are unpredictable. And I encourage you guys, to do the same. And just to kind of finish up on, on COVID-19, um, I think an unfortunate problem that will happen with this is that dentistry will get more expensive. We are going to have to improve our PPE, even though we are some of the highest professions with, you know, personal protective equipment. When you see, you know, an implant surgery, for example, it looks like we're doing heart surgery. Patients will see us more as healthcare providers, which I think is a positive. They're going to realize actually how good our sterile techniques are compared to many other doctors that they go to. So that's a good thing that will come out of this. We have time with our families. Like I just mentioned, this is something that, you know, you can never get this time back. As a friend of mine said, the, the days are long, but the years are short. So we need to try to appreciate the times with our families. And I think based on all the things I just talked about, having this mental and physical break is needed for us. You know, if you suffer from back pain or neck pain, there's a good chance that you, if you haven't done dentistry for two weeks, it may go away. Or mentally, even though you may be struggling right now with, you know, where am I gonna get money to pay my mortgage or my, my loans or food for my family, you may not be struggling with that patient that was gonna come in. Oh no, Karen's coming in again. Oh no, John's coming in, oh no. So that can help us give a, get a mental break and focus on you know, doing things around the house, playing with our kids, playing with our dogs. And the last thing that I would say is that we're united in this together, not only the whole world, but the dental community. We're all going through the same thing. I mean, that's never happened before in history where we've all been going through the same thing except for maybe the struggles, you know, except for the first part of this lecture. So I think we should get 
peace in that, in that I'm going through the same thing you're going through. Any big speaker you see, it's going through the same thing that, that you're going through. We're all going through this together. So if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them here. Also, my Instagram is Dr. Kyle Stanley, where I talk about this a lot. I do live interviews with people. I mean, you guys can message me if you, if you have any questions about this. Also, if anybody is struggling themselves and you think that there's nobody that you can talk to, message me. Please message me because I've been there. I've been depressed before. I've wanted to quit our profession and I've come out of it and I'm much better because of it. So um, I oh. encourage you guys to, to message me. I'll, I'll share a bit of a story as well. Just while I've got you here, I've gone through something personally, very similar, you know, in my, I reckon my, my hardest year personally was uh, probably first year of dentistry. First year out. Yeah. Um, first year out of dentistry, I was diagnosed with, I think I, I graduated, we, we got our certificate early December, late November here, right? Uh, we would have finished our exams in November. I started work December 14, right? That same day as I was going in, as I was driving from uh, Melbourne to Ballarat, which is a two hour drive. So I was, I, my first job was in a rural type setting. I, um, I was, I just previously had a biopsy on a lump in my neck and I was diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. on, on the drive to my first job on day one. Right. Um, all good now, right? No issues, but this was day yeah. one of dentistry. And I remember I was given, so I, I had surgery in radio and I was given, I think, four weeks off and then went straight back to work. So I started in Jan anyway. And that first six months, I remember being the toughest time. I remember shaking as I was giving local anesthetic, you know, first year out. I've like, been there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it, it, for me... I was working six days and, and whatnot and I was under the pump and, and that was first year out after going through this. And the biggest thing that helped relieve me was actually leaving that setting. So sometimes the setting that we're in is very conducive to stress, but you need to, we need to try and find what's causing those stresses in our lives and kind of try and pinpoint them. And sometimes it is work, but it might be multiple factors. And, um, you know, I'm really, yeah, that was how, that was how I came up with this lecture was just like researching it yeah, yeah. and saying like, why am I going through this and learning from it? And I tell you, me sitting here and talking about this is like therapy for myself. Yeah. The more I talk about it, the more, I mean, selfishly, the more I, I feel better and I, I understand what was going through my head because See, at the time I thought I was the only one as, as I'm talking about it for me it's still difficult so I'm in this it's still difficult to talk about phase right and yeah well the, hey it's great you're doing it in front of 250 people that's pretty awesome yeah yeah <laughs> um I, I want you to show some cases on implants but we got some people who've got their hand up does anyone have any questions they want to jump in on this before we look at some implant cases yeah feel free anybody to uh to ask any questions someone's got has anyone got any questions someone's got their hand up no I think just while you're getting these cases ready, some of the kind of key take home points that I kind of got out, um, especially right at the end there was your purpose. Like that defining your purpose, not just, you know, today, but in life. I think it's about implant, but it's like talking about mental health, and then for example, dentistry now, what's going on? There's someone who's going to get it. 
um, yeah, I think defining your purpose in life is is huge, and keeping your purpose away from dentistry is yeah the most important thing. And I still struggle with that. Mother. Um, every day, I still judge myself every mm. day on what I've done at work. I can come home upset, and uh, I'm still learning that, you know. But I'm only six years out at the moment, so I'm still trying to learn these things. Yeah. Yeah, it's it takes a while, you know. It took me a year of going through this to see all these different factors, understand them, and be able to um, to do something about it. Yeah, and to start to talk about it because I was of the thought that if you're depressed, you're weak. I was I was one of those people that thought that. And then I was one of the people that was depressed. And I'm like, wait a minute, am I weak? What, what's going on with me? And the more I started talking with people, the more I realized that it kind of made me more human. I, it, it made me actually normal. I yeah. think the people who haven't gone through this no. may be the people who uh, are, are less normal. So many of us, now that I've been talking about this, have been telling me like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one. I didn't know you were going through this. Yeah. No, I think it's becoming more than obvious now that that's not the case. I think mean, we know that. I think there's still limitations though. Like one of the issues here in Australia is just as an example, I don't know how many of you know this, but it's important to know. You need to have your life insurance and income protection sorted before you start, um, fortunately before you start getting treatment. Why? Because the second you start getting treatment, these <laughs> Companies are aware hey, of Kyle. It. no longer. They won't cover you. They won't cover. Could you just mute Ming? That would be yeah, Kyle, helpful. I think. Do I have to do that? Yeah, you have. I to think do it that. needs Sorry. to be the host. host. Thank you. How do I do that? <laughs> Exit the big screen if you're in big screen, and yeah. then if you open, if you press the participants panel, um, I actually think she's gone. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. oh, I can search for her. Okay. See if she's there. Yeah. Chris says it's oh, done yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, you got to get your insurance sorted first. You know, like our Australian Dental Association to their members provide five free consultations, but that even, cool. I'm I'm almost certain that that would still use a like a Medicare or what you guys would call number or like a code. Yeah. So they right. Would, they'd be aware of it, right? So. For those listening, you need to get your insurances and stuff sorted first because the second you start applying, the first questions they ask you are, you know, what what background have you got? Right. To? What have you had done? So someone was asking, I'd like to get a copy of the recording if possible, worth listening again. So I'm actually going to be posting, I'm going to be recording a new version of this, um, a little more, a little longer version of this. So if you just or on my Instagram, I'll, I'll be putting the link up probably in the next two weeks. So um, that'll be through through my website. Cool. Yeah, and for those of you that are in the US, you'll be able to get um, continuing education credits for it actually, which is kind of cool. And I have to give I have to give a shout out actually to um, MIS Implants because they're willing to sponsor a course for CE credits, even though they get no, I'm not talking about implants at all. So that was very cool of them. Not very many companies were willing to do that. Yeah, we've got um, we've got Dent Supply Serona on board today, handing out the CE credits to to students awesome. for today's recording. So really thankful cool. to my Serona as well for helping. Yeah. Us. Very great. Um, any questions? Let's see. It's a lot of thank yous. Um, That's nice. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm just wondering. How have you um, changed the, your communication style when um, explaining revisions with your clients? Yeah, great question. So that has completely changed. I was very much, you know, I do a lot of like implant perio pro stuff. So I was very much like, yeah, hey, you're going to get an implant. It's going to be the greatest thing ever. It's going to last forever and blah, blah, blah. And now it's like I almost try to talk patients out of doing treatment. I sit and go through every little thing on the consent form and tell them, 
yes, this is very successful, but it could fail. You know, let's say implants in the lower job, 97% success rate over 10 years. But that means that you could be one of those 3% of people. And if that happens, um, if it was something I did wrong, I'm happy to redo it again. But if it's not, um, you're gonna have to repay for it again. And I'm very honest with patients about complications as soon as something happens. And we do what's what we call a treatment agreement, which says in the treatment agreement, and we go over with them, we actually read it to them word by word on if something fails or breaks or whatever, that it's um, this much and it's all spelled out in there. So it's definitely changed. It's definitely changed a lot. And I've become, I feel like I've become much more open with my patients instead of like trying to sell them on something. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. So there was a question. Oh, sorry, sorry. go ahead. Question. I've got a question yeah. for you. A great talk, by the way. Um, thank you. The, you. I think you were mentioning earlier in your talk that your father was a dentist and obviously uh -huh. you've gone down the same pathway. Um, would you recommend dentistry to your children? And if, if not, would you have done something differently or would you go back and change time if you could? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think I wouldn't recommend it actually. Um, I love dentistry. I'm passionate about it. I love what I do, but I wouldn't want my son to go like any profession. If you told me any profession has 564% likelihood, 564% more likelihood of committing suicide, I would say, no, don't do that. I think dentistry is a great profession. You know, we, we can support our families. We can really help people, but it's stressful. I think when my dad went through dentistry, it was a different time. You could put, like you said, you, you throw up a sign and you have 10 people waiting at your door. And that just isn't the same thing. And, you know, my, my dad actually went through this type of anxiety and I didn't realize it until I was an adult, until I went through it, that that's what it was. And so my dad was stressed out about stuff. From, from being a dentist and he worked so hard to you know support my brothers and my mom and everybody that I really appreciate what he did working all those years. But the short answer would be, I wouldn't recommend it for my son. Um, there was a question, um, sorry to ask another one, but um, there sure. was a question. No, as many questions you guys want. <laughs> There was a question about whether your wife um, understood the stress that you were going through and how you um, how you were able to work through that or be in the trenches. Like you said. Yeah, um, the short answer is no. Short answer is no. And that was a um, really, really hard thing for me because I wanted I wanted her to understand but she couldn't understand, you know, she, she hadn't been there. She didn't know what it was like to, to think about a patient suing you all night or to, to think you may lose your license or all these different stresses. And I think that's why I say so much that it's so important that we talk to colleagues because I talked to some people who were in dentists and they said, um, what do you mean? Every job is stressful. You're gonna quit dentistry and go do another job? All jobs are stressful. And I think there are stresses in every job, but they're different, right? They're different. I think that just when you look at the suicide numbers, I mean, there's, there's something different about what we do. So yeah, that was a, that was a hard, a hard one for me. Thank Some, you. Someone's just asked, how would you explain this to your partner? And um, I'm still struggling with that. So I'll ask the same question. <laughs> how do you um, yeah, talk to your partner about this? Well, I mean, you can, you can hopefully, you can hope that they understand, but more than likely they don't. It's just a, uh, you know, they, they didn't go through dental school. They, they don't run a practice. They don't do this or that. I mean, 
I never wanted a spouse that was a dentist because I wanted to be a human when I came home. Yeah. And so many dentists marry dentists. And I think maybe that's one of the good things about it, right? Is they can talk about the stresses maybe a little bit better and understand that. But I like coming home and not talking about dentistry if, poss if possible. And I think that this is important when I say like separate your purpose from your profession is that when you come home, you try to leave as much of your profession at the practice. So, yeah. I think a lot of us struggle with that. Yeah, for sure. Any other questions that I missed? Oh, one thing, someone was talking about dental school. One thing that um, I forgot to mention is that many of us are overachievers. We, are, we did well in school, we worked hard, we had to do well in, in high school to get into college, to do well in our, our dental tests to get into dental school, and then we had to do well to graduate. And many times the first time we fail in our life is when we're practicing. And that is a hard thing to deal with. When you have had this like, I don't fail attitude, and I was like that, I was like, I'm an overachiever, I do it all, I do everything great. And then all of a sudden, a patient doesn't like it or something fails. And you're dealing with that on someone that paid you a lot of money to do that. It's a really difficult thing to deal with. So I think it's like, I wish that I would have failed earlier in my life and, and learned earlier how to cope with this, this failure. Um. I coped with it in first year uni and learned very quickly after, yeah. <laughs> after doing really well in year 12, but uh, I, it took me first year uni to get a whack across the head before I had to wake up. Um, I, I actually think in light of everything we're talking about, I don't know how necessary the implant cases are. What are your thoughts? Let's see what people think. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if it's necessary right now. We can, um, we can do another one another time or whatever you guys can see it on my Instagram or something. Yeah. But I think that, you know, in the same way that it's, I always get so mad when, you know, cause I have a lot of topics that I talk about. I talk about implants and guided surgery or perio pros, whatever. And I always throw this mental health thing in and not very many people want to have me talk about this at symposiums. Yeah. And I think this, this sad reality is that nobody makes money off of it. Yeah. Right. No companies are like, oh, great. He's going to talk about none of our components or none of our products. Yeah. Let's, you know, pay him to fly across the world and talk about this. But so we, where we need to have that come from, I think is like the dental societies, the dental academies, you know, the American Dental Association, the Australian Dental Association, because what I'm, what I'm, what I would love to do is have this be a required topic that we have to do. Like for us, we have to do 50 credits every two years. I don't know what it is for you guys, probably something similar. But I would love to have this be a required credit because really the only, the only required things we have to do are, are HIPAA, which is like patient privacy and um, sterilization. Yeah. But you can't do any of that if you're not in the right frame of mind. Yeah. So I, that's, that's one of my goals is to make this a topic that we talk about and that's required for us to talk about, you know, once every two years, which isn't that much. Yeah, we, there's a heap of people asking for uh, another talk from you. So uh, <laughs> we'll see We'll see how long the- um, See if we'll we can see, make it happen. Yeah, we'll see if we can make it happen. Thank you, Kyle. Um, we're, you know, just finishing on high achievers, we're, we're about to get one of Australian cricket players on board. Yeah. Um, he's a really high achiever and he's been uh, uh, through a heap of things as well and he's an absolute star in Victoria where I'm from and so uh, we're going to hear his take and what he thinks he, how, he can give us some hints on how to manage the stress so hopefully that'll follow Super on cool. well from what you've been talking about mate and uh, we really appreciate you taking some time today and, and thank you so much thank you